Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to you all. Thanks for joining us today. I hope everyone is keeping well or uh, reasonably well. It's uh, currently thundering and pouring down rain here in Madison. Uh, so I wish you sunshine uh, wherever you happen to be. My name is Lucas Rickert. Uh, I'm the George Erdung Chair in the History of Pharmacy uh, here at UW-Madison. I'm also the Historical Director of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Um, so besides uh, being based in the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy, um, uh, I'm very happy to be affiliated uh, with both UW's Department of History and the Department of Medical History and Bioethics. Uh, perhaps some of you don't recognize the name uh, American Institute of the History of Pharmacy, the AIHP. It was established in 1941. The AIHP is a nonprofit uh, and independent member-based historical operation. Its mission is, uh, and I quote, advancing knowledge and understanding of the history of pharmacy and medicines, unquote. The Institute is dedicated to the collection and preservation of uh, pharmacy-related um, objects, artifacts, and images. Since 1959, the Institute has published a journal called Pharmacy uh, in History, and the Institute also sponsors a wide range of awards uh, and commendations for, for students uh, and for established researchers. So these include annual prizes for excellent scholarship, uh, but also visiting fellowships and uh, financial awards for graduate students. The AIHP is a constituent member of the American Association for the History of Medicine and has uh, long standing and developing relationships uh, with the International Society for the History of Pharmacy, for the Alcohol and Drug History Society, for the Consortium for uh, Science, uh, for the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. So if you want to learn more about uh, AIHP, you go to the places that you usually uh, go to. You can check, uh, check out uh, the Institute on Facebook uh, or on Twitter, uh, or you can go to AIHP.org. Now, before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Brito, I'm going to make a few uh, quick remarks, uh, if you'll indulge me, because I suppose I want to give you a bit of a backstory. This uh, seminar series, this Kremenar, uh, is named after Edward Kremers. Uh, he lived from 1864 to 1941. He was the second director of the University of Wisconsin Department of Pharmacy, which later became the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy. And he was a co-founder of the American Institute of the History of Pharmacy. Throughout his career, he strongly believed in the importance of history and the value of humanistic research in pharmacy and the health sciences more broadly. Uh, according to the historian John Periscindola, who I think is listening out there, Kremers uh, also encouraged critical thought about drug consumption and control, not only in the United States, uh, but uh, more globally. He encouraged the news media, uh, politicians, and pharmacy leaders to think uh, about the meanings and assumptions associated with words like drug, narcotics, and medicines. Of course, these are issues that we struggle with today still. Language matters, and he worried about demonizing certain groups, and that included pharmacists. So uh, Kremers opposed prohibitionist impulses uh, and organizations, arguing that restrictive measures uh, wouldn't solve the problem of misuse of certain substances, might actually uh, enhance the misuse. So Kremers uh, also, and I think that this is uh, vitally important now, uh, resisted language and policies that placed uh, blame on foreigners uh, and marginalized groups for drug addiction and crime. 
in 2020, drug policies and the ways of thinking and talking about substances or treatment approaches and, uh, and addiction, and this includes the pharmacy profession's rules and regulations, they're changing rapidly. The understanding of intoxicants, drugs, pharmaceuticals, and addiction have direct impact on policy and health. So knowledge about these topics is a fundamental step to understanding uh, the pressing, uh, pressing challenges within healthcare, both in uh, pharmacy but also uh, medical fields uh, more widely. An awareness and understanding of different cultural contexts across both time and national boundaries is a key element in generating such knowledge. One of the surest ways for fostering that knowledge is through direct access uh, to expertise and, and different sources and ideas, which is what we're attempting to do today. In the past, the AIHP and the School of Pharmacy have offered historical programming, but uh, we think, I think, it's vital to start up a new seminar series uh, right now. We're in the midst of a grim global pandemic and um, with over 100,000 now perishing in the United States and the numbers far higher globally. At the same time, we're still facing an opioid crisis in the United States and beyond the boundaries. These criminars, uh, I reckon, are just one way to contribute to a wider discussion to improve discourse and to connect with each other. Through our seminars, we'll encourage new thinking, we'll encourage new research, and we'll encourage uh, participants of all kinds. Because as Americans and non-Americans grapple with problems like access to essential medicines due to high prices or uh, inadequate supply or, uh, you know, the development of a COVID vaccine or opioids or cannabis medicines, it's useful, I think, to investigate and understand different aspects uh, of pharmacy and drugs in, in di uh, disparate uh, contexts. The practice of pharmacy itself is changing rapidly in the US and abroad. New medicines, new education practices, artificial intelligence and automation, uh, pharmacy benefit manufacturers or managers, I should say, as well as offshoring. Look, the pharmacy is in transition. As the president of AIHP, Clark Ridgway, noted uh, recently, the Institute needed programming, publications, and collections that, and I quote, cover a wide range of topics and serve an audience that is broad and inclusive. Cannabis is one of those topics and you are the audience. The theme for this first uh, seminar is cannabis. Don't laugh, folks, but I've been thinking a lot about cannabis recently. Uh, cannabis regulation and uses has evolved over the centuries and is becoming more widely accepted with over two thirds of states in the US having an approved cannabis program. However, changing policy and a lack of controlled clinical trials has uh, led to uh, questions on the safety and effectiveness of uh, various uh, therapies. Although there are conditions for which uh, cannabinoids may be helpful, uh, pharmacists and health professionals have to be thinking about uh, potential contra uh, contraindications, excuse me, uh, different side effects, and drug-drug um, interactions. Now, historians and other scholars, meanwhile, uh, should be clear-eyed in their approach uh, to the developing literature and the gaps in the historiography they ought to be developing solid analyses uh, based on the very best primary sources. And then, in my view, uh, contributing 
to uh, policy-based and political discussions, as well as um, contextualizing uh, biomedical uh, studies. So that brings us uh, to our very first uh, Creminar guest, Dr. Lena Brito. But before I introduce her, just uh, a quick uh, few items about this afternoon's session. The structure for today's talk is pretty simple. Uh, Dr. Brito, uh, Brito is going to um, share with us a presentation roughly half an hour or however long she wants to take because I suspect it's going to be very interesting um, and would rather listen and like to listen to her very much. Um, but once she does finish up, um, we're going to have a conversation. She and I am going to ask her a couple of uh, questions. Um, and as we have this conversation, um, you can develop some questions yourself. So the Q&A box will be open and you can uh, jot down your questions and then these will be addressed at the end. So let me tell you about Dr. Brito. She is a uh, scholar of modern Latin America and the Caribbean. She was awarded her PhD from New York University in 2013. She has been awarded grants from the Social Science Research Council, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. There's more. She's been awarded uh, grants from the Charlotte Newcomb uh, Foundation and the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation. In 2014, she received a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies at Harvard University, where she developed uh, the manuscript that she's talking about today. The focus of uh, the presentation uh, and the, the following discussion is her book, Marijuana Boom, The Rise and Fall of Columbia's First Drug Paradise. It was published by the University of California Press roughly a month and a half ago or so, so it is brand new. Uh, it is based on extensive field work uh, and oral history in the Colombian Caribbean, as well as archival research in Colombia and the United States. So congratulations on this brand new book, uh, Dr. Brito, and we're very lucky to have uh, you with us today. And I, and I turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanna make sure that uh, everybody can hear me. I Okay, excellent. Uh, so thanks so much, Luke, uh, and also Kristen and Greg for this invitation and for organizing the whole thing during these trying times. Um, I'm very excited to be here sharing my work, and yes, the book uh, came out kind of like in installments in advanced copies in early ja in January 2020, uh, and then officially in March, uh, basically in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, it, it, it's an honor to be here with you guys and to be the first in this cannabis series uh, where other colleagues whose work I know and I admire very much are also going to be presenting. So I just want to encourage all the participants to pay attention to the rest of the lineup and, and attend the other talks, uh, which promise to be uh, outstanding too. So. Um, uh, that said, uh, this is the cover of the book, uh, um, the cover of my book published with the University of California Press. And I actually going to start um, the brief um, talk or presentation that I have about the book uh, and what the project is about here where I am, uh, which is in the city of Chicago. Um, so, you know, before uh, the pandemic uh, put an end to the world as we know it. Uh, the big news of 2020 was uh, that many uh, states that legalized marijuana were kind of like finally implementing that legalization. So the state of Illinois and the city of Chicago were, were one of those epicenters where the legalization of cannabis uh, was coming uh, um, in force. Um, so this is a picture taken from the Chicago Tribune when they were reporting on the uh, opening of many marijuana dispensaries in different parts of the city. 
And the picture is obviously the loan line in one of those dispens dispensaries. And it comes with the following uh, caption, nearly 3.2 million in legal weed was sold in Illinois on the first day of sales, marking one of the strongest showings in the history of marijuana legalization in the United States. So the point that I want to make is that this, the book that I just published, which is about uh, Colombia mostly in the 1970s, uh, its publication happens to coincide with a sweeping change to marijuana policy throughout the world uh, from decriminalization to legalization, right? In Colombia, medical marijuana is legal, albeit not yet completely regulated, but recreational consumption is still prohibited and is a contentious matter. In the United States, 26 states and the District of Columbia have fully legalized marijuana. But the point is that before all this happened, way before marijuana came in from the cold, an agrarian country in South America traveling a rock road to industrialization and urbanization supplied the largest market in the world with tons of weed at a moment when youth challenged the U.S. government's forms of domination and hegemonic projects at home and abroad, one joint at a time. And that country uh, is my home country, Colombia. So that country, Colombia, has been represented in the international stage uh, for at least half a century by two mestizo men with thick mustaches, right? So Juan Valdez, which I assume many of you uh, know and remember, was a fictional character who during, beginning in the 1960s and throughout the 1970s, promoted Colombia coffee to the international market. Escobar, who I assume many of you also know, was a cocaine kingpin who in the 1980s and early 1990s led a war against extradition to the United States. And between these two icons, because at this point Escobar is as fictional as Valdez is, between these two icons extend the history of a country that in only two decades transitioned from a coffee republic to a narcotics nation. But before the bucolic Valdez yielded to the warmongery Escobar, marijuana traffickers from the Colombian Caribbean coast partnered with U.S. buyers in the early 1970s to flood North American cities and suburbs with the illegal weed, thereby capitalizing on growing countercultural demand, and at the end of the decade, these traffickers resisted the frontal attack of the state. They were popularly known as marimberos because marijuana in this part of Colombia was euphemistically called marimba, which is actually the name of a musical instrument. So those traffickers who traffic with marimba, with marijuana, were called marimberos. So popularly known as marimberos, these pioneers of the drug trade make Colombia the main drug supplier of the U.S. drug market, and later on became the first target of the war on drugs in the country. However, the boom that they brought to life is a forgotten chapter of the innocent era before the cocaine industry car bombed the whole country. So these marimberos, this is a picture, by the way, uh, taken from an um, uh, uh, honors thesis uh, produced uh, by a couple of students in the Universidad de La Guajira. Uh, and it uh, comes from a private archive, and it's just um, a bunch of marijuana traffickers, marimberos, having a party, uh, a parranda, that's the uh, name for these kinds of parties in this part of the country. Uh, in a port near uh, Riwacha, which is the capital city of the Department of the Guajira. And I don't have an author and I don't have a date for this picture, but just the bibliographical reference. So these marimberos came from the Guajira Peninsula and the neighboring Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, which you can see just right here in the map. 
These two areas, located in the northernmost section of the country's Caribbean coast, have been considered as barely belonging to the nation state. They are considered borderlands and like frontiers. So it's not a coincidence that Macondo, the fictional town of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, 100 years of solitude, which is also the paragon of pre-modern isolation and endogamy, was located somewhere in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta after the Buendia family migrated from the Guajira. So my question was, how was it possible that a peripheral region and its people became the birthplace for the illicit drug trade that turned Colombian coffee republic into a narcotics nation? And why did this first illicit drugs boom not only decline, but also fall into oblivion? So these unanswered questions were like the points of departure of my book. So for the past three decades, Scholars, journalists, and artists have focused on untangling the ins and outs of the hydra of cocaine processing, trafficking, diplomacy, and war. Academic literature on the popularly known Bonanza Marimbera, that's the name for the marijuana boom, because remember marijuana was called marimba. The, the academic literature for the popularly known Bonanza Marimbera, however, is scant. Most existing works were produced at the time of the boom, meaning in the late 1970s and early 1980s, when social scientists, politicians, diplomats, and others sought to explain a novelty for which there were no precedents and for which they had no frameworks. So between academic debates and ideological controversies, Experts and stakeholders forge a consensus according to which this boom, this marijuana boom in the Caribbean coast, was a regional anecdote of the absence of the state in a frontier society, and the result of the moral degeneration that U.S. consumers and smugglers brought with them in their search for new sources of marijuana. On the other hand, its decline has been interpreted as the logical outcome of boom and bust dynamics and the takeover of the country by the cocaine cartel. So in my book, I wanna tell a completely different story. So Marijuana Boom, the rise and fall of Colombia's first drug paradise takes a completely different approach and instead concludes that the marijuana boom was as dramatic a turning point in the history of Colombia as the one that took place almost a century earlier with coffee. Moreover, I find that the marijuana boom was also a critical component of hemispheric relations to the extent that it served as a training ground for the war on drugs in South America. So obviously, I don't wanna deny the weakness of the central government and state institutions in the marijuana region. And I don't wanna deny the crucial role that US buyers played in stimulating this illicit export economy. What I do wanna argue is that the causes of this boom cannot be found in what a Colombian anthropologist, Margarita Serge is her name, has called the myth of the absence of the state. And I also believe that the answers, the causes and explanations for this boom cannot be found in external factors solely. So instead, I examine and analyze the process of integration of the broader region that includes the Guajira Peninsula and the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta into national and international political, commercial, and cultural networks centered in the Indian interior of Colombia and oriented toward the United States. So my argument actually is very simple and it has kind of like two uh, complementing sides or, or faces. So on the one hand, I assert that the boom itself was the product of unintended consequence from a series of state interventions 
that the Colombian government carry out in pursuit of agrarian development and nation state formation. From the early 20th century into the late 1960s, these modernizing reforms were implemented with support from U.S. federal governments and private investors. The contradictory ways in which local, regional, national, and international groups of interest coalesced in response to these state reforms created new arenas of contestation and accommodation, which materialized in the marijuana boom of the 1970s. On the other hand, and without disregarding boom and bust dynamics and the rapid expansion of the cocaine business as factors for the decline of the marijuana export economy, I want to call attention to more important causes. In particular, the political and diplomatic struggles to define the state response to the growing drug trafficking between Colombia and the United States. I think they better explain why the marijuana export economy collapsed. So let me move here a little farther uh, because I just realized that I just skipped a couple of slides. So I just wanna get up to speed with my own PowerPoint. There you go. So this is the arguments that I just said for the emergence of the boom. And here are the arguments that I'm explaining right now for the decline. So the criminalization of producers and traffickers and the militarization of the region between 1978 and 1980, which was a concerted initiative on the part of Colombian and U.S. governments, were deliberate strategies to sort out deep domestic crises in both countries, which were unfolding in a context of increasing militarization due to the escalation of the Cold War at the end of the 1970s. So I argue that the reason for the decline is that the marijuana region became a laboratory for the U.S. and Colombian government to experiment with a novel approach to a statecraft and international cooperation. This novel approach considered drug production and traffic as security threats that warranted bilateral mili military interventions in peripheral areas where national sovereignty and U.S. hemispheric hegemony were being challenged. On the ground, the campaign of crops eradication and traffic interdiction prompted marijuana traffickers to develop mechanisms of survival that gave way to a ferocious competition amongst them. So their business practices morphed from certain degree of reciprocity and solidarity to indiscriminate violence in the form of killings, robberies, and betrayals making marijuana cultivation, commercialization, and exportation an expensive and less viable practice. So in order to explain emergence and decline, I develop a multi-scale method. And this multi-scale perspective allows me to move from like the local level to the regional, to the national, to the international. I also use approaches from like commodity studies. When you uh, identify a commodity and you kind of like follow it through the chain from production to consumption. And I also use methods of political, cultural, and diplomatic history. Then I organized the story, the narrative, in what I call the three distinctive cycles of the marijuana boom, ascendance, peak, and decline. So I'm going to walk you through each one of them very briefly, and hopefully we're going to have time to talk in more detail about them uh, during either my conversation with Luke or during the Q&A. So the ascendance. In the first part, the Ascendas, which is uh, comprised by two chapters, chapter one and two, I examine the Greater Magdalena, which is the broader region uh, in which I, uh, the 
Guajira Peninsula and Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta are located, and you have the map just right there. That's the Greater Magdalena, the northernmost part of the Colombian Caribbean, and that was the name that you received until the late 1960s. So in that first part of ascendance, I examined this region, the Greater Magdalena, from the earliest 20th century up to 1972 approximately, in order to understand how deeply rooted traditions of contraband smuggling and production of tropical export commodities, such as bananas, coffee, and cotton, intersected to create the basis for the new marijuana export sector. Then in the second cycle, the one that I called peak, I explore the bountiful years between 1972 and 1978, more or less, when this inchoate micro-traffic in marijuana turned into a full-fledged export sector after the emergence of local crops exclusively designed for exportation. And in the map, you can see like the areas of cultivation and you can see some of the ports and some of the areas where uh, improvised landing fields were created um, to uh, receive all the airplanes that were coming from the U.S. to pick up the tons of marijuana for exportation. So what I'm arguing here in this section of PIC, which is also comprised by two chapters, chapter three and chapter four, is that marijuana cultivation, commercialization, and exportation fulfilled the promises that modernizing state reforms made but failed to deliver. The marijuana boom succeeded, succeed in resolving, albeit temporarily, conflicts over land, labor, and markets, boosting the region's agricultural productivity, entrepreneurial innovation, capital accumulation, urbanization, and cultural projection. And cultural projection is precisely one of the most interesting aspects of the peak of the marijuana boom, because it was an essential component of the rise of the marimbedo, the marijuana traffickers, as an emergent merchant class. So this cultural projection allowed the formation of a discourse of masculine honor and virtues with which these traffickers sought to cement their newly acquired economic status. So what they did was to use the musical folklore of the region, which is known with the generic term of vallenato, vallenato music, to circulate these idealized images of themselves as successful agrarian entrepreneurs and men of statue. They resorted to the paranda, which is the kind of party uh, uh, around this kind of folkloric music. Um, they resorted to the paranda, this particular form of festivity associated to vallenato music, to create a new arena of social projection. And in doing so, they open a space for this themselves in regional society, again, temporarily. So I'm gonna play very briefly uh, one of the many songs, uh, just an um, uh, uh, excerpt of one of the many songs that I use as sources in my own book to talk about this process of formation of the marijuana traffickers merchant class. Um, it is um, uh, interpreted by the guys that you see here in the slide, uh, Los Hermanos Zuleta, uh, Emiliano and Poncho Zuleta, and it was released in the year 1977. No me Solo quiero que tengan pendiente, que trabajo y que a nadie le pido. Yeah. 
All right, so let's take a look at the, at the lyrics. So the title of the song is Soy Parrandero y Que, uh, which I translated as um, I'm a party animal, so what? Uh, and the uh, excerpt that we just listened to, uh, this is what it says. What the hell? I don't care what people say that I'm a degenerate drunk. I just want them to have in mind that I work and I don't beg. So what if I'm a party animal? Who cares? I'm Loki, which is the nickname of a marijuana trafficker at the time. I'm Loki. Listen to me. Who cares? If I party, it's because life is very short. So what I discover in the research and what I argue in these sections of the book is that during the peak of the marijuana export economy, Vallenato Parrandas marked the rhythm of the marijuana cycles of production and trade by serving as transitions between one operation and the next, as showcases for abundant wealth, and as occasions for creating and disseminating rumors, jokes, tales, and songs that represented Marimbedo's attributes as manifestations of the male regional identity. The music and the celebratory ritual around it helped in various ways to form the emergent and transient class of marijuana intermediaries and exporters. With Vallenato music and in Parandas, Marimbedo made sense of the ambiguity of the new export economy which was socially legitimate, yet illegal. It was central to regional life, yet underground for the nation and illegal in the hemisphere. So the set of gender values, cultural practices, and discourses that Vallenato and Parandas helped marijuana traffickers to articulate presented this paradoxical export economy as a social order is structured by reciprocity and solidarity instead of disparity and competition. And at the crux of these paradoxes, Vallenato music and Parandas constituted the arena in which marijuana traffickers organized their social lives and forged a class consciousness of themselves as agrarian entrepreneurs, which eclipsed the intrinsic inequalities of the marijuana boom, mask their own precarious position in it and ultimately contributed to their demise. And their demise is precisely the main topic of the last part of the book, The Decline, which is chapter five and chapter six. So in the third and last cycle, the decline, I addressed the violent years between 1978 and 1982, approximately, when producers, intermediaries, exporters, and buyers became targets of criminalization, and the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta and the Guajira Peninsula and all the villages, ports, cities in the area became militarized settings. In the process, the marijuana export business collapsed. So to conclude, during these three moments that I traced from chapter one to chapter six, I hope to be making this contribution by addressing Colombia's forgotten history of its marijuana boom, the very first export economy of illegal drugs in the country that became one of the major drug producers even until now. My book seeks to contribute to decoding one of the greatest conundrums of our times, how and why illicit drug economies and cultures emerged in the Americas in the last quarter of the 20th century and how massive drug trafficking and the violent structures that sustain it was born. So thank you so much, and I'm really very excited to uh, engage in a conversation with you all and answer your questions or your comments. Dr. Brill, I just wanted to thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I don't know. If I've, I've, I've got your, your oh, book right nice. here in front of me right now. Um, 
I, I encourage other people to to grab a copy as well, uh, uh, whether or not Kindle or or uh, or a hard copy. Um, one um, question: Do you want me to stop sharing my PowerPoint? Uh, sure. Oh. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, I, as this is relatively new to all of us in, in putting together this seminar, um, thanks to everyone and thank you, Dr. Brito, for for bearing with us as we as we sort of work out the, the process. And um, um, I, I think that I just kind of wanted to, to take the, the, the chair's privilege and just, you know, have a quick conversation with you for 15 minutes uh, as people sort of gather their thoughts and um, come up with a few ideas. And, and folks, please, you know, jot down questions in the Q&A, um, which will then be asked afterwards. Um, but I had, after reading the book, um, and do you mind if I call you Lena? Of course. Okay. I've been um, calling you look. <laughs> I, I just thought I'd better ask, that's all. Um, I, I had a few questions for you that were, were both big and small, mm -hmm. um, things that sort of popped out at me. Um, and so I'm going to just sort of throw a bunch of questions at you if you're okay with that. Yes. Yeah, and just see where, see where it goes. Um, the first I suppose has to do with your discussion about uh, um, agrarian modernization. Um, I'm in Wisconsin right now, where farming is a big is a big big thing. Um, you made the case, I think, really convincingly um, that agrarian uh, modernization um, and nation state formation um, was imperative to Colombia's. Uh, marijuana boom, right? Um, mm -hmm. So more generally, uh, should we be thinking about um, drug history in other countries in, in this way? Um, yes, thanks for that question. Um, I mean, it all depends on what moment in time and what geography we're talking about, but I'm convinced that for Latin America, in the second half of the 20th century, this argument really applies. Because we can see that uh, happening in the so-called golden triangle of the Pacific coast of Mexico, right? Uh, we see that also happening in Bolivia's Chapare region. Uh, mm -hmm. We see also that happening in Peru's Alto Huallaga region, in Colombia's many coca, coca cocaine regions. Uh, so I do believe that um, this uh, argument about how um, the unintended and unexpected consequences of agrarian modernization and nation state formation stands for all these cases in Latin America in the second half of the 20th century. And other colleagues have made the case for these other countries as well, because obviously I don't do research on these other countries. I'm reading other right. people's work. And for example, Daniel Weimer, he has made a very convincing case about Mexico and how modernization and, and anti-narcotics actually uh, work in tandem. Uh, so he's not talking so much about drug production itself. He's talking more about drug works and drug repression and drug control. Uh, but still, he's making a case about modernization as well. Um, we have Paul Gutenberg making a very similar argument for the case of Peru. Uh, we have Liliana Davalos making a similar uh, argument for uh, the Colombian coca regions in the Amazon basin. So kind of like we drug historians have been testing the waters of this argument uh, using different cases, and I'm convinced at this point that for Latin America in the second half of the 20th century, this is the case and sustains. And why? Because there's a common history here. It's not just a coincidence. There is a transnational common history, a common historical process is happening here. And that is the conception, design, and implementation of an agrarian development, developing model that it was based on the principles of the Green Revolution. And what happened is that some of the consequences of that model, of the Green Revolution model, marginalized small producers and marginalized and affected the peasant agriculture 
peasant agriculture in all these countries that were barely industrialized, that were mostly agrarian countries, or well, maybe with the exception of Mexico a little bit, um, but were making tracks into industrialization. So what I believe is that this model of green revolution of agrarian development that privilege large producers, right, which is, mm. I guess, what you imply when you use Wisconsin and the Midwest, that's the example for that, right, uh, created right. the conditions for the marginalization of these small producers and the, pe and the peasant um, economy. And that coincided mm. with the coming of age of a new generation with new social and cultural practices, creating new market, new forms of consumption, and therefore new markets of consumption. So these small units of production and this peasant economy found in that new market, right? Like the opportunity that the legal uh, economy were not offering to them because the ones who were being benefited by that were large producers, not peasants. Right. So I do believe that is like many things in history, you know, like uh, several factors um, coincided and came together at the same, come to fruition at the same time, uh, producing kind of like the perfect storm is I think one of the metaphors that I use in my book. Uh, but I do definitely believe that the emergence of um, these uh, drug export economies in different countries in Latin America uh, in the 60s, 70s, 80s um, has everything to do with the unintended and undesired consequences of that specific model of agrarian modernization. That makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, the only monkey wrench I can think of, and maybe in Canada and the United States, has to do with the development of small sort of mom and pop craft weed shops, mm -hmm. um, where you're seeing the return of slightly smaller operations um, that are not necessarily mass produced. Um, and that's for recreational cannabis rather than mm -hmm. medical cannabis. But that's, I mean, I just wanted to sort of add that to yeah. what you're saying. And remember that Latin America, all these different countries, we have like very long traditions of producing uh, commodities without value added, you know, like tropical export commodities. So this mm -hmm. was like a, um, um, fitted very well with our own productive traditions, right? Uh, and, and if you add to that these unintended consequences of that model of development and the emerging of a new generation with new forms of consumption and understanding social, socialization and et cetera, then kind of like you have all the ingredients that you need for this recipe. It kind of brings me to the present. I, I suppose I just wanted to clarify quickly with you about how drug laws in Colombia have changed a little bit. So what's, what, just for those of us who may have missed it or don't know, what's the situation now with uh, Colombian drug laws? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, regarding marijuana specifically, we have kind of like um, uh, a two-tier system. So on the one hand, medical marijuana has been fully legalized. It's still in the process of being regulated, uh, so it's not working completely because we're still waiting for uh, Congress and other legislative bodies to produce the regulation uh, for that market, but it's at least uh, fully legalized. And then we have recreational marijuana, which have gone through many ups and downs throughout decades, because at some point in the mid-1990s, a constitutional decree, a constitutional order, allow people to have their personal dosage. And since then, and for many years until kind of recently, um, recreational marijuana was not legal, but it was not criminalized. And therefore, there was a very vibrant and, and, and solid uh, like marijuana smoking culture uh, in the country. Mm. More recently, like the new uh, very conservative right-wing governments uh, began to try to reverse that change. Mm -hmm. And through different presidential executive orders and other things like that, um, have begun to criminalize uh, recreational smokers and therefore producers as well. So uh, we are right now in that moment of con con that very contentious moment uh, where a lot of 
organizations of consumers uh, have been, you know, using direct action uh, to to fight against this reversal of the law. Um, and that included fumatones, which is kind of like the name for marathons of public marijuana smoking in designated parks or public areas as a form of like protest and, mm. and, and, and massive um, manifestation, right? Um, so we have kind of like, like these two things going on at the same time. And on the side of the medical marijuana market, there's something very interesting happening because um, a lot of Canadian companies, don't ask me why Canadians, I have no idea, I need to do more research about it, but they're mostly Canadian companies that are investing in the future of the medical marijuana in Colombia, because they mm -hmm. know that our climatic, topographic, et cetera, like physical conditions make mm -hmm. many regions of the country ideal for the cultivation of, of, of this plant. So they have been investing in like buying lands and like, you know, securing uh, all the permits uh, that they need, um, getting registered with the government and et cetera. And what's happening is that we are seeing a process of marginalization of the small producers that existed before and were working uh, in the shadows because mm. they were illegal, right? So now they are trying, some of them have organized, uh, especially those producers with indigenous um, identities or ancestry, they have been organized themselves in like, um, all kinds of NGOs and, and companies and et cetera, to participate of that rising and growing medical marijuana market, to not let foreigners, in this case, mm -hmm. Canadians, to take over a market that they uh, supply for decades illegally, uh, mm -hmm. but still. So it's very interesting to see like the politics uh, going on. So I'll ask you a quick follow-up, but then I think I'm gonna invite um, Greg Bond in to ask some questions for the audience, uh, from the audience, uh, people who have been uh, asking questions on the side. Um, so my, my very quick follow-up though to that is, um, you know, the role of pharmacists and medical doctors. Do you have this uh, medical uh, marijuana marketplace? Can you just maybe just sketch out how uh, pharmacy uh, fits in? Mm -hmm. Yes, so far pharmacists have not played up an important political role, but doctors are like really trying to participate in this at different levels. Some of them like working with these uh, multinational companies, others actually on the other side working with the small producers that are fearful of being marginalized and left out of, of, of the new legal market. Uh, I, for example, um, have a, a relationship of collegiality with a Colombian doctor that actually lives in New Jersey, uh, but is working very closely with an indigenous community that used to produce marijuana for the illegal recreational market and now are trying to make tracks into the legal medical market. Um, and, you know, like kind of like complying with all the uh, organic production, uh, no use of pesticides and all these international standards um, mm -hmm. in order to, to participate in the medical marijuana market. So I know that doctors have played a role, but pharmacists for some reason have been um, not very active in this uh, ongoing political battle. I see. So Greg Bond uh, is the assistant director at the AIHP, and he's been watching very closely some of the questions that were coming in. Um, and Greg, um, you're muted right now, but oh, I see you've unmuted yourself. Um, what kind of questions have we gotten so far? Uh, we've got a lot of interesting questions. Uh, hopefully we can get through all of them. Uh, the first question for Dr. Brito, I'm gonna uh, combine a couple questions that uh, came in on similar topics. We have a question from Alberto Vargas who asks, was there any use of marijuana during the colonial independent, independence epics, mostly among indig indigenous groups? Was there a prohibition at these times and what are the implications for 20, the 20th century boom? But before you answer that question, Dr. Brito, uh, we have a similar question from Chris Duvall, who's one of our presenters in a couple weeks, who asks uh, if Dr. Brito encountered any oral histories or folk folklore uh, 
that accounted for how cannabis came to Colombia was it seen as a European, African, or indigenous crop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those two questions are, are very much related, and thanks for that, because obviously my book doesn't go to the colonial uh, times at all, uh, in part because there's no much scholarship about it. Uh, everything is kind of like just rumors, but there's no really any ethnographic work about this, uh, very few. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the, the, the few things that I managed to learn. Uh, and that comes from like reliable sources. So we do know that in, in Latin America, Mexico was the place where marijuana really became kind of like an important crop in colonial times. We don't have similar uh, evidences of something like that happening in New Granada, which was the name of Colombia in colonial times. Um, what we do know, and this is thanks to the work of anthropologists, is that um, people of African descent, especially from West Africa, um, talk, um, kind of like have a, a, a vocabulary and, uh, and, and, and talk about uh, marijuana as part of the many different um, plants and herbs that they used um, in their medical practices, but also in their recreational practices. And actually the term marimba, which is the euphemistic term used in the Caribbean region for marijuana, and therefore the marijuana boom in Colombia is popularly known as bonanza marimbera, and the traffickers as marimberos, that term marimba, um, we have been able to um, trace that to these uh, traditions of people of African descent in the Caribbean coast, right? Uh, the term that they used was actually mariamba, uh, very similar, not exactly the same. And um, the anthropologists who have worked with like these communities in the Caribbean coast, um, maroon communities, former slave communities, people of African descent, um, have um, explained that this terminology came actually from West Africa. So it's very likely um, that if we have a concept and a term for that, so it's because we also had the plant and the practice, right? Uh, but there's no much scholarship and no much research about it, so it's hard to know for sure. What I do know about the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, uh, which is the area where all this marijuana for exportation to the United States was cultivated, is that um, there were very important traditions of marijuana production in this mountain range that goes back to the 1920s and 1930s, when the United Fruit Company um, was going through the golden years uh, of, of their activities in the country, because they have a very important banana zone in this, in this part of the country uh, for exportation to the United States and Europe. And it is in the context of the golden years of the United Fruit Company in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta when we have evidences of the first um, crops, of marijuana crops in the region, right? Um, but it's hard to know. Um, uh, it all seems to point to the fact that these crops emerged during the United Fruit Company headache. Uh, that they don't go back to colonial times. Uh, but again, we need more research about that. Okay, very interesting. Uh, I, I hope to get through all these questions. We're getting a lot of interesting questions, so I apologize if we don't get to yeah. all of them uh, to our attendees are answering are asking. We have a couple questions here about uh, sort of the international trade aspect uh, of marijuana. Richard Del Rio asks, uh, I I believe you described these cannabis producing regions as being isolated during this period. How did the international business model get developed? Uh, what is cannabis's pre-export commodity history, commodity history in the 20th century? And before you dive into that question, uh, Betty Tuning uh, from UW-Madison School of Pharmacy asked a uh, somewhat similar question. In the 80s, after marijuana's drop, it seems that the Colombian cocaine cartels arose with links to LA. Did that build on the marijuana industry's demise uh, in its sales to the US? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, about kind of like the isolation of this region is 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 that's actually kind of like part of the argument that I'm uh, that I put forward uh, as a counter argument to 
popular beliefs and even to the academic consensus. Because yes, many areas in this region were very isolated. They didn't have any roads uh, that connect them to uh, the interior of the country. Um, they didn't have any, any kind of infrastructure. Were like very, very agrarian, rural uh, areas. Um, but that doesn't mean that they were isolated because they were, since colonial times, very much connected to the greater Atlantic economy. Because through maritime transportation and through the many different uh, natural ports in this part of the continental coast, they have a very um, systematic and constant um, trade with the Caribbean islands, uh, especially with the Dutch islands that are closer to this part of the coast, of the Colombian coast, but with the rest of the, of the islands in the Caribbean, with the U.S. East Coast, right? Uh, as now that I mentioned the United Fruit Company, that it was um, operating in one of the sections of, the, of, of, this, of this region, um, they have permanent uh, maritime transportation and communication between Santa Marta, which is the main port uh, of the Banana Zone, or was the main port of the Banana Zone, and the east coast of the United States, particularly New York. So the isolation was very relative. Isolation to what? Isolation to Bogota and the Indian interior of Colombia, yes, but not as isolation to everything. They were simply oriented tour a different geography and a different economy. And what is interesting about these different reforms, uh, state reforms um, that were implemented in the late 40s and throughout the 50s and 60s um, to modernize uh, the, uh, the agrarian sector in this region is that what it happens is that it's severed those connections with the maritime world of the Caribbean and the Atlantic economy and force elites, popular sectors, everybody in between to change orientation. And instead of being oriented toward the Caribbean and the Atlantic markets, they have to pay attention to Colombia and became increasingly more dependent on Bogota on the Indian interior and on the coffee economy of the Indian interior. And that is precisely kind of like the process that I'm tracing in the first chapters of the book, in the section that I call Ascendance, that shift, right, from connecting to the maritime world to being dependent on the Colombian Indian interior and its economy and its main market, the U.S. No? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Pablo Gomez, who says, oh, wait, Hold on, sure. great if presentation. I... Oh, thank you, Pablo. Uh, I'm not sure I answered the other question about oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. We, LA. We... The, um, LA and the cocaine. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Yeah. Uh, no, I just remember that they were two different questions. Yes. Um, so the other, the, the about the cocaine, the rise of the, of the cocaine cartel and, and cocaine becoming the main commodity, the trendy uh, drug to consume in the 80s, right? Uh, yes, definitely, that is a factor for the decline of the marijuana sector. There's another important factor for the decline of the marijuana sector, which I just mentioned in passing in my book, because it requires more research, and I'm not doing that research. That is the emergence of um, marijuana crops here in the West Coast. Because then the United States were not in the United States market was not anymore dependent on foreign suppliers, which was initially Mexico. At some point, it was also Thailand. At some point, it was also Jamaica, and then Colombia. Right um, now, it was self-sufficient, and that has everything to do with the emergence of new seeds and new varieties, new crossbreeds that were uh, that could be cultivated both outdoors and indoors. And that's kind of like engineering with these seeds and with these plants and with these varieties, like allow um, consumers who were also entrepreneurs of marijuana, right, to uh, invest in the marijuana sector here in the United States. 
So that's another factor. But again, I mentioned it just in passing because I didn't do research about that. That requires research here in the United States, in California, in Oregon, um, and that's a different story. But that's another factor. The point that I wanted to make in my book is that external causes uh, cannot explain it all. And we really need to pay attention on, on the way in which the Colombian state in association with the U, with US governments kind of like defined the proper approach to deal with this and how that approach which consisted on criminalization and militarization both things at the same time is part of the problem and it yes produced the decline of the sector in that sense it was very successful but at what price right at the price of like I don't have the numbers right here, but a lot of like killings, assassinations, uh, indiscriminate violence in different forms. Um, so that's kind of like the main point that I want to make, that, that we need to consider the state not as a source of solutions, but in this particular case, as, a, as part of the problem. Mm -hmm. uh very interesting. Uh, and getting back to Pablo Gomez's question, he asks, uh, could you please talk a bit about the relationship between ideas about race region in Colombia and the history of the Marimberos, and I apologize for my awful Spanish accent, and how is this different from the history of cocaine that ensues in the 1980s, 1990s? Oh, thank you, Pablo. That's an excellent question. And actually, that's one of the reasons why I started my talk and actually my whole book with Juan Valdez and Pablo Escobar, two mestizo men with mustaches. Because I do believe that part of the reasons why for the, for the Colombian governments of the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, that option of criminalization and militarization became kind of like evident and the only possible solution is because all these ideas, underlying ideas about race in region in Colombia. Because both the Guajira and the Sierra Nevada are part of the, of the, of the Caribbean coast, part of the lowlands. Oh, I'm so sorry. Sorry about that. It happens. Um, yeah, and my phone is in sync with this, so I'm sorry about that. Um, so, um, what I was saying is that um, these two regions are the lowlands, are the Caribbean regions, and therefore in Colombia, race is completely attached or intertwined with region. So we are conceived ourselves, and that's actually part of the discourse of the coffee republic as a mestizo nation, right? We are a, a country of like um, the mixed race between whites and indigenous and Africans, but we are mostly white, no? And we are mostly like light-skinned mestizos. That's the discourse, right? And obviously, all these um, uh, regions in the lowlands, including the Guajira and the Sierra Nevada in them, but many others in the Amazon basins, in the Pacific coast, are seen as inferior, uh, as kind of like not the geographies of civilization. So it's, at this moment in time, the government uh, kind of like rely on those discourses about the inferiority of darker races, in these frontier areas of the national territory as a justification to go after them in such a repressive and violent way, right? Mm -hmm. To use and display the monopoly of force and violence of the state onto this region and its people, which is something different to what happened with the mestizo um, people that uh, comprised most of the labor force and the management and the elite of the cocaine cartels and the cocaine organizations. They were all come from, uh, came from the Indian interior of the country. Um, many of them were like white or light skinned mestizos. Um, most of them were men because obviously women participated of this economy too, but in, in very different um, uh, responsibilities and functions and roles. Um, so, for the Indian, the Indian center Colombia, uh, the cocaine economy um, 
was more relevant and more important, not just because it was creating all these problems with the United States and it was producing all this illegal money that it was floating the national economy and creating problems of inflation and others, but also because it was, it came from within the mainstream nation instead of from without as it was seen in the case of the marijuana export economy, right? Uh, so, because it came from within the nation, from within the polity, right? The cocaine economy was taken more seriously, less lightly as it was taken the marijuana economy. So definitely those race and region um, categories uh, are operating here very well. And my book have a lot to say about that, but again, that was not kind of like the main focus of the book. The main focus of the book was kind of like to give account of the trajectory of this whole process from emergence to decline um, and explain how it emerged, how it reached a peak and how it collapsed. Um, uh, but I, and, and I don't know many people working on the history of drugs in Colombia from that like kind of like racial and regional perspective. Uh, it would be fantastic uh, if more people were kind of like uh, taking up that approach and see what they find. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Lena, uh, Lena, very quickly, um, you know, just to add to what you're saying, because I find it so fascinating to hear about these uh, racialized assumptions and shifting categories. I've been, along with um, Professor Jim Mills at Strathclyde University, working on a a collection of um, cannabis histories around the globe and sadly you weren't able to take part but um, one of the one of the sort of the core ideas is that racialized assumptions and, and categories of race uh, are deployed or weaponized in all countries whether or not it's mm -hmm. Iran or India or the United States um, South Africa or wherever that um, often that there are groups of people that are using cannabis and investing it with certain racial meanings and I'm certainly looking forward to to reading more about this in the future in other in other spots around the globe but I yeah. sort of just stick my my two cents in there yeah definitely and I think actually historians here in the United States have contributed a lot to that conversation when studying um, um, you know like the criminalization of uh, black and Latino men uh, in mass incarceration and how like the war on drugs has been the perfect excuse uh, for a second Jim Crow, which is actually the, the term uh, mm -hmm. coined by one of the historians that's working on, 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 on the 1980s and 1990s. Um, mm -hmm. So yes, definitely it's a, it's a global history. And it, obviously, in each case, it plays out differently depending with the hierarchies and the and the history behind. Uh, but there's a commonality. Um, yep. Yeah, no doubt. Certainly, seems a common thread throughout many of these histories. Uh, switching gears a little bit, here's a question that's close to my own heart as both a historian and an archivist from John Deke, I believe. I apologize if I get names wrong. Uh, could you please talk a bit about uh, source collection? The picture of the Marimberos triggered this question. I see you have a background in anthropology, and seeing as this is a topic close to the present, I imagine not all the research was done in the archives. This is a, a, a question that probably many historians of modern topics have. Yeah, well, my, my, one of the main methodologies I used was oral history, right? Um, and what is really uh, one of the most positive things for me personally about uh, working on this book is that it allowed me to combine methodologies from like the three disciplines in which I have been trained, which they are journalism, anthropology, and history. And oral history is really kind of like um, uh, the conjunction uh, of all of them in different ways. So I did a lot of archival research, both in, in Colombia and in the United States, with um, governmental sources, with newspapers and magazines, of course, um, uh, photographic archives, things like that. But um, I consider that the essence of this book is definitely the oral history. And that it was the first thing I did. 
I began this project as a master thesis in anthropology. So my first approach was to do field work and to do oral history. So I just traveled the region um, and I actually um, kind of like relied on my own personal, personal and family history because my father and my father's family are from the Guajira, uh, but I was born and raised in Medellin. And, and, and this book was a way to kind of like reconnect with that other side of the family and rediscover my own Guajiro side, right? My own Guajiro identity. So thanks to my family, initially, I got in touch with a lot of people in different towns that had participated in this um, economy at different, in different capacities as cultivators or in transportation, um, as journalists, etc. And then uh, once I kind of like established contact with, with certain people, I began to navigate uh, their uh, networks of friends and compadres and neighbors and et cetera. And one interview always took me to another one and another one. And I collected uh, many interviews, most of them um, uh, life histories, uh, but many were just thematic interviews, just very journalistic interviews. So I make a combination of different journalistic and anthropological methodologies um, to, to work on this. And I do consider that talking to the people that lived through these times, many of them passed away in more recent years because they were older when I talked to them. Uh, but I do believe that my conversations with them where are the heart and soul of this book and are the heart and soul of my understanding of what happened. Uh, I develop my own understanding of what happened in dialogue and conversation with them. Uh, I find it very interesting. I've done some oral histories myself and I've uh, had some similar experiences as you of not getting to people in time, uh, but then finding out some very interesting stuff from people who uh, participated in the adventure studying. Mm -hmm. A uh, topic you touched on a little bit in an earlier question was about uh, the role of the nation state. And we have several questions on that topic. I'll read you three of them that are kind of related and, and see if you can come up with an answer that perhaps quest, uh, gets to all three of these questions. Uh, Bradley Bugardi, I apologize again if I if I butchered your name. Can you perhaps give a bit more of an explanation regarding the connection between nation state formation and marijuana in Colombia? And then uh, Alberto Vargas again asked, uh, how significant was the role of the government and military partners, in quotes, uh, i.e. Cor uh, e. corruption in the growth and decline of marijuana in Colombia? And then one more question here. Uh, uh, Nidia Olvera asks, uh, is there evidence that the Colombian government used drug control as a pretext to combat political opposition groups? Okay, good. They're very big questions, all of them, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, about kind of like nation state formation. Um, yes, it's, a, it's a obviously a long term process that is started in the early 20th century. Kind of like the, go the national government um, um, designing and negotiating with foreign investors uh, the development of different areas within this region, right? So the banana zone of the, uh, under the control of the United Fruit Company, which was very close to the port of Santa Marta, it was one of the first um, initiatives in that respect, right? When the national governments in Bogota wanted to like uh, use uh, the fertile areas in this part of the country for mass production of export commodities tropical export commodities. So since then, and throughout the whole 20th century, um, the national government, national governments in plural, in association with uh, the World Bank, the uh, Inter-American Development Bank, with the US, different US governments, with the US Department of Agriculture, um, with USAID, et cetera, um, came together in different moments in time to, in, to design and implement similar um, um, economies, export economies, right? So my point is that the, the tropical commodities became kind of like the instrument and tool to integrate this region of the country into the, the geography of the of the of the nation, right? 
and into the territory that the national government uh, ruled, uh, claimed sovereignty over, uh, and decide on, right? So that's why I talk about nation state formation through agrarian development mostly, and mm -hmm. all the different uh, aspects that came attached to that, right? Uh, all the educational and cultural and social policies and initiatives that were contingent on these mm -hmm. different agrarian development projects taking off, right? Um, so that's on the part of the nation state. So that's why I'm saying there's it's not the absence of the state, it's actually the process of its state formation what created these unintended and undesired consequences um, that later on became the perfect, um, created the ideal conditions for the emergence of this economy. Um, the other question was about militarization, correct? Um, and, and also uh, government uh, using drug control as an excuse to go out to political opposition. Yes, definitely. So those of you that are familiar with Latin American history, uh, you know that in the 1970s was a very um, um, violent moment in the continent, right? Because we have all these military dictatorships uh, taking over with military coups. We also have all these like guerrilla organizations trying to spark uprisings and insurrections and, and, and create a vacuum at the level of government in order to take power. So we have like different focus of, um, of vortices of, of violence where the state it is, one, is one of the participants is one of those violent actors in mm. the equation, right? In the case of Colombia, Colombia um, has always move in, in its own time. And in the case of Colombia in the 1970s, we don't have military dictatorships. We actually have a pact between the two main political parties at the time, liberals and conservatives, to take turns in the presidency and to divide the state apparatus among the members of their own parties. And that's what we call the Frente Nacional, the National Front. So that what happened is that this national front that began since the late 1950s, by the late 1970s, it was supposed to be over. But it was not only over, it was also exhausted. It reached a point of exhaustion because there, it didn't have le um, legitimacy and didn't have control over the country in any way, shape, or form. So what we see in the late 1970s is that sometimes very fast, sometimes very slow process of collapse and exhaustion of the whole political system, right? And actually many people began to talk about, oh, are we going to have a military coup? Are the military taking over since the civilians cannot control the country and cannot seize the reins of the government? That didn't happen. What happened is that the next civilian president that, to, that was inaugurated uh, in actually 78, is the one who implemented this very repressive uh, program that went after political dissidents, went after guerrilla organizations, um, very similar to what was happening in the Southern Cone at the time and also in Central America. And we call it our own dirty war, right? La Guerra Sucia. So anti-narcotics became one of those instruments that this president used in order to implement that system of terror that it was aimed at resolving the problem of legitimacy and governance that they had since earlier on. Um, so that's actually the last part of my book. In the book, in the part of the decline, when I'm like talking about how the collapse of all this, I located the anti-narcotics campaign in the uh, in the marijuana belt within that context mm -hmm. of generalized, uh, repre generalized repression mm -hmm. um, and trying to understand how these anti-narcotics techniques and goals mix and enhance these counterinsurgency strategies and, and needs in order to kind of like um, resolve 
the crisis of legitimacy and governance in which the Colombian political system was immersed at the time. So, um, Lena, uh, I have a couple of final questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, just, just maybe we can, you know, tie a little bit of it all together. Um, mm -hmm. um, I guess the first question um, that I had for you has to do with um, big takeaways. So, what might policymakers and politicians uh, learn from the history uh, of Colombia's uh, first drug paradise? So yeah. that's a big question, right? So that's that's the first one, and then um, the second one has to do with more culture and cultural fascination um, that people have with Colombian drugs. And you know, here I'm thinking of popular movies um, and television shows, whether it's Narcos or Traffic or Blow. Some of these are very limited and some sometimes just horribly, horribly wrong. Sometimes they're okay. Um, mm -hmm. But when you watch these cultural representations about about your research and about your country, what is it that you're you're thinking, and what should we know? Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna tackle the hardest of those questions first, which is about policy making. Okay, sorry. Um, no, that's fine. And actually, uh, I I like the question very much because I'm actually asking uh, that same question myself. Um, I do not believe that we historians have to worry about producing a scholarship that can be instrumentalized into policy. Mm -hmm. Because I do believe that there are other disciplines that are better suited for that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but that said, I think it's important to learn how to talk to politicians and policymakers, especially when we are doing what I'm doing, which is contemporary history, or recent history, whatever terminology you want to use, mm -hmm. uh, but history of, of, of recent times, right? So I think it's very important kind of like to learn how to talk to a, um, at that level and in that sphere, um, because I do believe that historical frameworks can help us understand long-term trajectories and long-term processes. And usually the disciplines that are better suited to talk to policymakers and politicians have a very short term uh, scope, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that's just kind of like what the discipline is about, no? Um, and that's an advantage, but at the same time can be a limitation. So that's it. I think that in my case, um, that argument about kind of like the role of the state in creating the conditions for economies like this to emerge is an important lesson. Because many times in those policymaker circles, they talk about the state as the solution to it all. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we don't. Uh, there's poverty. Like uh, more state. Like and and it's like, what exactly are we talking about here? You know, how are you under understanding the state? How are you defining the role of the state? And in this particular case, what we see is that that model of development that was under underlying all these different efforts and reforms and, and dreams uh, is part of the problem. Uh, so I think that for uh, policy making, uh, the lesson will be that to not reify the state and to not see in the state kind of like define, like bringing the state to these isolated regions. Um, it's, a, it's a concept that we need to put under the microscope and mm -hmm. examine. And it's not a ready-made solution for anything because actually it has proven to be the problem. So, but again, I'm very skeptical about policymaking for yeah. many reasons, but I'm just gonna talk about one of them. And that is that very powerful people in Latin America have been talking about the failure of the drug control approach or paradigm that we have for the last half a century, right? And I'm talking about here um, Enrique Cardoso, Cesar Gaviria, Cedillo, all those Colombian, Brazilians, Mexicans, and others, politicians and intellectuals that have come together to produce these commission reports about drugs in Latin America, about the war on drugs, and et cetera. And they have already uh, pointed out 
to some of these problems and to some of these taboos and to some of these um, um, ungrounded uh, beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. So we do have the information there, has mm -hmm. been made public, has circulated among the most powerful circles and nothing much has changed. So the problem at this point, in, from my point of view, um, is not so much at, at this point at the policy making uh, level. It's not so much about knowledge. It's about political will. And I don't see any political will to make changes here. So that's one thing that concerns me. So that's why my, my, my intended audience with this book is not so much policy makers. It's kind of like, well, academics, obviously that's a given but it's more like the general audience, because I do believe that we historians have the power to, to uh, contribute to critical thinking mm -hmm. and to question things, mm -hmm. uh, more mm -hmm. than just offer solutions, to question things and to question that lack of political will when we do have the knowledge to make better decisions, but it's not happening, right? So that's the reason why I'm a little bit skeptical about the, the, the policy making uh, uh, circles and about them. Probably really so. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> and about the production uh, of all these narco narratives, uh, no narco novelas as we call them in Latin America, or narco movies, etc. Uh, well, what I've been doing for these last years, when time permits, is to write about those productions. And I have published about Narcos, for example, by Netflix, and I have published about some movies in Colombia. And I try kind of like to, to write, to put on paper my point of view and my opinion about those productions. I value many of them very much because that's how we create common sense. And, and, and as a journalist, I, I'm, I'm a believer of the power of mass media communication. Uh, so when they are done right in the sense that there's a research behind, um, that there's no, um, um, they're not looking to uh, monetize the whole thing just like randomly and indiscriminately and, and, uh, and shamelessly, I celebrate when those efforts are made, uh, even when sometimes they fall short. Um, but still, I, I celebrate that. Um, and I think it's simply inevitable because that's one of the most important realities that many countries in Latin America have gone through in the last three, four decades. And obviously, uh, media producers, uh, artists uh, are going to step in and give us their point of view and their take on these developments. And that's fantastic because that's part of the conversation. Um, my only criticism is one is very evident that there, that there is the, the concern is more with the marketing and the profiting than with understanding uh, or giving people different yeah. points of view and different angles. Uh, to understand what happened. Uh, that's the only part that I really um, don't admire or don't like very much, but I still pay attention to it because I still think it's very important and that's how people, general audiences, are getting their drug history lessons. Right. Well, now people can get their drug history lessons from your book and from these criminars. Um, Look, I just wanted to thank you so much again for the presentation and having this conversation in, in Q&A with everyone. Um, it's been uh, revealing um, and, and, and fascinating. So uh, everyone, I encourage you to grab a copy of uh, Marijuana Boom. And um, I just also want to point out that we're going to be here again next week uh, at this uh, the same time uh, next week, uh, Chris Duvall, uh, is going to share um, some thoughts about um, marijuana in Africa. And um, I hope to see you all there. Thanks so much again, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Greg and Kristen, for organizing this and all the participants for being here, although I cannot see anybody. 
Uh, I can see a number in the participants list, uh, and it was an honor. So, and it was a lot of fun too. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. bye, -bye.